Okay, so if we can make a start. Um, my name is um, Grant Pitchen, and I'm from the Department of um, Forestry, Fisheries, and the Environment in South Africa. I'm based in Cape Town. And my task is to welcome you to the 16th session of the Global Ocean Oxygen Network seminar series. Today, as you can see in the titles below, our webinar will focus on the um, Manguela Eastern Boundary Upwelling System. Our first speaker will be Annette Carlson from the University of Connecticut, USA, and she'll be focusing on the Southern Manguela. While our second speaker, Ronran Curry from the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources in Namibia, will address issues in the um, Northern Benguela. Now, before we get to the um, presentations, I'd like to draw your attention to a um, session on deoxygenation at the fifth symposium of the effects of climate change on the world's oceans, which will be held in Bergen in April next year. A link will be posted um, in the chat, or you can um, scan the QR, which you see in front of you. So to get to our webinar, Annette Carlson will give a presentation um, entitled Assessing Drivers of Oxygen Dynamics in the Southern Miguela Upwelling System through the combined application of models and observations. Um, Annette graduated in o a BSc in Oceanography um, from California State Polytechnic University in 2019. And she's presently finishing off her MSc at the University of Connecticut, where her primary supervisor is um, Samantha Sudlecki. Today, she'll be sharing some of the results from her MSc. And before Annette gets started, I will ask attendees to please type their questions in the question box. We'll keep the chat to be used for other um, issues. And then with that, I would like to hand over to Annette. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Grant. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, Can everybody see me, hear me, and see my slides? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, so thank you so much, Grant, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm thank you also to the uh, webinar conveners for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to share um, my master's work with you all, um, like Grant introduced. Um, and I also like to thank all of my co-authors listed here, um, a lot of expertise and uh, discussions went into this work. Um, so to start off, like Grant mentioned, um, I'll be focusing on the Southern Benguela upwelling system, which is the southern subsection of the larger Benguela current system, which you see here flowing to the north um, along the west coast of Africa. It's bounded off in the north by the Lutterit's upwelling cell, um, which serves as a hydrographic division between the northern and southern Benguela. So these two subregions function in different ways. Um, and here I'll be talking about the southern subsection. Um, and to the south, the Agullis current flows um, towards the pole along the eastern side of Africa and retroflux back into the Indian Ocean. Um, and ring sheds much like the Gulf Stream or the Kuroshio current, depending on where you are in the world. And it's a source of heat and salt um, to the region. And then, like we said, it's a wind-driven upwelling system. Um, and here it's Seasonally, uh, in the summer, there are strong upwelling winds to the north, um, which bring nutrient-dense, cool water along the coastline. And then in the winter, there's a, a quiescent period where there's weaker upwelling um, to sometimes downwelling conditions. Additionally, subantarctic mode water, or SAMW, which will come up in uh, future slides, is um, the major source water to this region and it's well oxygenated when it arrives on the shelf. And just to introduce some um, smaller scale uh, dynamics that I'll be talking about later, um, within St. Helena Bay, uh, which will be the focus of this talk, there's a, a weak upwelling region along the coastline here, which will come into play with some of the data I'm about to show you. 
Um, there's a recirculation feature within St. Helena Bay um, that will also be highlighted. And then there's a strong upwelling cell off the coast of Cape Columbine highlighted by this blue circle. Additionally, I'll be showing you a lot of data from the St. Helena Bay monitoring line, which will be um, geographically where this red line is. So we know that the upwelling uh, source waters are well oxygenated when they arrive on the shelf, but we see hypoxia in this region. And so here I'm showing you uh, a box plot of the proportion of the St. Helena Bay transect that has oxygen of less than two milliliters per liter from Jared all in 2015. And what I'd like to show here is that in the beginning of the upwelling season, which is in about October, um, less than 10% of the transect is lower than two milliliters per liter. But then as the upwelling season proceeds, um, more and more of the transect uh, becomes low oxygen with a peak in about May when about 20% of the transect is uh, less than two milliliters per liter. And then as the winter season takes over, more normoxic conditions return to the monitoring line. So with that, I wanna take you to a near shore station off of Elands Bay, which is marked here by the blue, do uh, by the blue diamond marker. And this is near station one of the St. Helena Bay monitoring line. So here's that time series. Um, so I'm showing you time from 2009 to 2012 with oxygen concentrations along the y-axis on the left-hand side. The red line is denoting the hypoxia threshold of 60 micromolars uh, per kilogram. The gray circles are hourly data and then the black line is daily average data. And what I want you to take away from this is that there is hypoxia seasonally, but there is internal variability to the hypoxia where in 2009, for example, there was prolonged hypoxia for many weeks. And that's important to note because there's a West Coast rock lobster fishery that is set up along this coastline. And when this near shore uh, area is hypoxic, it pushes the lobsters uh, closer to shore. So in particular in 2009 and in other years, there was hypoxia along this near shore uh, area of the shelf that was also followed by an episodic anoxia event, which led to a, a lobster walkout, which uh, courtesy of Grant Pitcher, I'm showing you a photo of here from this year. Um, and what a lobster walkout is, is where the oxygen is so low in the water column that the lobsters will just walk out under the beach where they're then stranded. And so in this work, we're really trying to understand what are the drivers of the hypoxia in this region, because we know that the oxygen is well supplied to the shelf. So what's happening locally that's driving this? And if, if, if it's predictable, can we then predict it in the future? So um, now I'm gonna show you a transect from St. Helena Bay monitoring line again um, of oxygen this time. So the gray star is marking where that uh, oxygen time series is that I just showed you. And the cooler colors, the lighter colors are indicating low oxygen. And I just wanna highlight here that the hypoxia threshold of 60 micromolar is subsurface and mid shelf. So now we're gonna break down the, these um, different parts of St. Helena Bay that I introduced earlier to diagnose the individual drivers in each subregion of the monitoring line. So the basic overarching point is that the oxygen conditions vary based on your location within St. Helena Bay monitoring line. And so here I'm showing you a half molar of bottom oxygen concentrations from um, 2000 to 2012 from Jared all 2015 with uh, distance offshore marked along the left-hand side. And then the station markers are along the right-hand side. And the blues and purples denote low oxygen and hypoxia of 1.4 milliliters per liter or less. And then the greens and oranges are normoxic or higher in oxygen concentrations. So first, um, I'll be using terminology like nearshore, which denotes data that's less than 50 meters isobath depth, um, where the weak upwelling cell is. And it's characterized by seasonally low oxygen um, with ventilation in the winter. And you can see that by the alternating greens and purples in this time series. And in this data, we consider stations one and two to be the nearshore region. And then if we move a little further offshore to the mid shelf, 
which are is firmly within that recirculation feature that I showed you a, a schematic of earlier. And this region is characterized by sustained hypoxia due to that recirculation feature, um, and is data between 50 and 150 meters depth, um, or station three through station five of the monitoring line. And then if we move further offshore to the outer shelf, or station six and seven, between 150 and 250 meters depth, um, we don't really see as much hypoxia, and this region of the monitoring line is mostly influenced by the Cape Columbine upwelling cell and is outside of the bay dynamics. And then further off shelf for greater than 250 meters, we see less variability um, and is more open ocean uh, driven. So with this knowledge, I will bring you to my motivations for sharing all this work with you. Um, we want to assess the drivers of hypoxia by looking at winds and the source of nutrients to the shelf. And then we're going to look at the drivers of ventilation um, by, again, we're looking at source waters and the winds. So I'm going to do that first by developing multiple linear regressions to isolate source water chemistry variability. And I'm going to do that using two separate data sets, one um, to train the equation. So those stations are marked in the teal circles on this map. And then I'm going to evaluate it with um, the data sets uh, marked by the red X's. And I'm going to develop an equation to predict AOU, which I'll get to in a second, and then nitrate. And I'm going to use temperature, salinity, oxygen, and nitrate data from uh, 1990 to 2017 to generate these equations to isolate um, the source water. Uh, I'm going to use data only from 15 meters to 600 meters depth and offshore of the 250 meter isobath, which is marked here on this map by the black dashed line. I'm also going to use variance inflation factor to assess for collinearity among the predictor parameters. And then I'm going to use AIC to select the best model. So here are the results of that. So here I'm first showing you the AOU uh, equation. Um, and so for those of you who are not familiar, AOU is a tracer of remineralization, which is calculated by taking the oxygen concentration at solubility and then subtracting the oxygen concentration that was observed. And so on this plot to the left, I'm showing you observed AOU concentrations along the X and then predicted AOU along the Y. And the gray markers are the calibration data results and then the purple diamonds are the evaluation data. And as you can see, this MLR shows skill in predicting AOU from, in this case, salinity, nitrate, and density. So I also did this for nitrate of the source waters. And so it's the same setup. So ob observations along the X and then MLR along the Y. This time, um, the teal markers indicate the evaluation data set results. And again, this MLR shows skill in predicting nitrate from, in this case, temperature. So now we have our source water predictor uh, equations. We're going to now apply them to evaluate the modifications um, to nitrate and AAU compared to the initial conditions off shelf. <clears throat> and I'm going to do that by um, showing you plots of delta nitrate and delta AOU, which are the observed concentration of either parameter minus the MLR predicted. So for example, if delta nitrate is positive, then there's more nitrate than what was upwelled initially. If delta AOU is positive, then there's more AOU signal than what was upwelled and less oxygen because the, they're um, negatively related to each other. Similarly, if um, delta nitrate is negative, then there's less nitrate than what was upwelled. If delta AOU is negative, then there's less AO, AOU than what was upwelled and more oxygen because again, they're um, reversely related to each other. And so just to step through that, let's look at some data. So here I'm showing you September of 2007 at the onset of upwelling, and I'm showing you nitrate concentrations where the darker purples indicate higher nitrate concentrations. And we can tell that this is a beginning of the upwelling season because um, I have isopycnose plotted here and they're shoaling at the surface. Um, indicative of new water being pushed to the surface through ecman transport when driven upwelling. And you'll note that mid-shelf, um, there is a pool of higher nitrate concentrations here, 
and in the near shore region where my cursor is. And then also following the 1026.6 isopycnol to about 100 meters depth offshore. So now I'm going to apply my MLR and subtract what my MLR is going to predict the upwelled source water to be. And we get the result of delta nitrate. And you'll notice that along the shelf about midshore, the color is now close to zero, indicating that that nitrate is near source water concentrations. But you'll see that there is still elevated nitrate remaining in the near shore and also following the 1026.6 um, isopycnol to offshore, indicating that there was shelf modified water um, in this cross section here. And you also notice that there's a pool of um, lower than predicted nitrate. Um, I just wanted to point it out here, but I'm not gonna get into that right now because I don't quite have enough time, but I just want to acknowledge that that is there. And then um, if we move to the end of the upwelling season in May of 2008, we know that this is the end of the upwelling season because now the isopycnals are moved out of their shoaling position to more horizontal in the water column. And again, we see that there's a pool of elevated nitrate values mid-shelf subsurface, indicating shelf modification of the, the shelf water. And then if we look at the same year, so still looking at May 2008, but now we're looking at Delta AOQ. So again, reds indicate higher than, predict, higher than source water concentrations. We see that elevated Delta AOU values are associated with hypoxia, which I'm showing you the oxygen concentration of 60 micromolar contour here in white. <clears throat> and that could be useful in tracing hypoxia on the shelf using these shelf metrics. So now I'm going to show you a half molar from 2002 to 2016 with distance offshore along the left hand side. And this is bottom delta AOU values. Um, and in the black box, I'm highlighting um, that there's elevated delta AOU in the mid shelf region, um, which is associated with hypoxia. So meaning that the hypoxia and the high nutrients that we were seeing in these, con these cross sections um, are born of trapping and decomposition of locally produced biomass. They're not being infected in from offshore. So with that, what conditions lead to the ventilation of the different regions of St. Helena Bay? And here we've benefited from a relatively new wind product from the Wind Atlas for South Africa. Um, and the data citation is there. So let's first move to the near shore region um, using the 20 meter uh, oxygen data again. So there's a lot to look at here. So just to kind of step through it, um, I'm again showing you time from 2008 to 2012. Um, with a longshore wind stress along the left-hand side, um, and that's the purple bars that you see on this plot. And then there's two streams of oxygen data. The um, black stars are from <clears throat> St. Helena Bay Station 1 at 20 meters, and then the black line is the 20-meter mooring um, along the, and the oxygen uh, bar is along the right-hand side. And the main thing I want you to take away from this is that Oxygen in this particular region is responsive to changes in wind direction and magnitude, as I'm highlighting by these red boxes. So you can see that in particular in 2009, during the upwelling season, which is the gray shading here, we have sustained hypoxia, and then there's a reversal in wind direction, which uh, leads to a ventilation event in that part of the shelf. And that happens um, typically at the end of the upwelling season going into winter. And when we relate these two, we find that there's a significant negative relationship between oxygen and longshore wind stress, which I'm showing you a scatter plot of here with oxygen along the X and then a longshore wind stress along the Y. And this means that downwelling winds ventilate this part of the bay. But that's not the case in other parts of this monitoring line. So let's move a little offshore to the mid shelf region using the 70 meter moorings. So again, same color scheme. So purple is a longshore wind stress. This time, <clears throat> the black stars are taking the bay station three at 70 meters data. And the black line is the 70 meter mooring um, at uh, 
yeah, for 70 meter more. <clears throat> and what I want you to see here that there's two um, ventilation scenarios for this particular region. The first is um, ventilation during strong wind events at the onset of the upwelling season, marked by these red boxes, where we see <clears throat> strong upwelling conditions with a, an increase in oxygen concentrations. <clears throat> and then similarly, in winter, we see increased oxygen following strong uh, downwelling events um, or like winter storm conditions. Um, and then when we relate these two, we find a weak but significant negative relationship between oxygen and longshore wind stress. And that in part could be driven by the ventilation happening in differing seasons, but the takeaway message is that it requires a strong wind event to bring oxygen to this part of the bay. And if we move further offshore towards the Cape Columbine upwelling cell, <clears throat> we see that there's no hypoxia observed in that data record. But what I'd like to point out <clears throat> is that there is a <clears throat> seasonal oscillation, <clears throat> excuse me, seasonal oscillation of oxygen concentrations with a peak at the beginning of the upwelling season shaded in gray. So that brings me to conclude <clears throat> that oxygen is supplied to the mid shelf by newly upwelled water in spring, shown by this cartoon. And then at the end of the upwelling season, <clears throat> it, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the upwelling season, a hypoxic nutrient dense pool has formed subsurface, <clears throat> which is then ventilated in winter via downwelling at the near shore or storm driven mixing. <clears throat> and it's associated with high delta AOU values. <clears throat> so what does this mean for the lobsters? Well, given the relationship between the near shore region and oxygen and wind stress, if we had more wind stations along the coast, we could develop an early warning system for hypoxic events. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and with that, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you to my funding agencies, my collaboration team, and the members of the Sled Lucky Lab. If you have to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, there's the QR code for that. Um, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Annette, for making um, the complicated story understandable. Um, can I remind attendees to please um, place any questions in the Q&A box? I see there is one at the moment. And if I read that to you, Annette, it says, there seems to be a lot of high frequency variability at the station you presented at the beginning. I think that's the 20 meter station. Maybe weekly, do you know what drives this variability? Um. Yeah, thank you for the question. So I think you're, I think it's asking about <clears throat> why there's so much reversal in the uh, oxygen record. And there's just like high frequency variability in the oxygen. And um, I think that's mostly driven by, it's really shallow station. So it's only 20 meters of water um, and it's really sensitive to wind. So if there's even a day where the winds slacken or are slightly in downwelling uh, conditions that would lead to a change in oxygen. So. I think it's just because it's a really shallow station. Um, and next, can you see the next question? Um, do you think that hypoxia has a connection to climatic driven events like ENSO? Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know that my data really uh, encompass climatic timescales, but I think there is some literature that uh, says that ENSO does affect this region, but I, I'm not really well versed in that. Okay, yes, yeah, so I think um, it's better recorded in, in Namibia, so the northern Benguela. So um, perhaps Bob um, Brownring can answer that in her presentation. Um, <laughs> then from Barbara Frank, oops, sorry. thank you for this talk. My question. If you would succeed in predicting hypoxia events, how would you, this help the lobsters? <laughs> yeah, so one way it could help the lobsters is um, that if we are able to predict hypoxic events and where the most severe hypoxia is, we could 
uh, inform fisheries managers to maybe close the fishery in that region and or reduce soak time of the lobster pots so that um, there's a higher likelihood of the lobsters living, perhaps. Um, that's just an idea. Yeah, I think um, in the past, there have been attempts to, in fact, um, rescue rock lobster from the beach. So you can be better prepared to do that. And then um, another question, what do you think is the role of the sediment oxygen demand in maintaining or strengthening hypothesis during the upcoming season? Yeah, I think it has a, a really strong role. I didn't present um, some other data, but I think that there's a lot to do with um, the sediment water interface in um, denitrification and driving hypoxia. So it's definitely important. I didn't really touch on it here, but thank you for your question. Yeah, I think particularly at the interface, just above the sediment, we've found um, a lot of drawdown or oxygen consumption in that area. Um, Peter Brunt, um, what is the role of vertical mixing on the shelf in upward nutrient and low oxygen supply? What drives the mixing? Mm. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I haven't really been thinking about the physics in that direction. Um, but I would say the winds, you know, driving the upwelling and creating overturning, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll have to think about it more. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, well, you made mention of the um, winter mixing, which, of course, is drives um, that, that's the most obvious mixing we see, deep mixing, and that's in winter, and that, in fact, ventilates bottom waters. Um, Andreas, can you detect any effects of runoff on oxygen in your data? Or could you, or could you in more polluted regions? Um, I don't really account for runoff because um, there aren't that many rivers in this particular region. But I mean that's a good point. Um, I mean I imagine you could train the MLRs to consider uh, nutrient input from rivers and then from the offshore and then figure out what's happening on the shelf locally. Um, Yes, that's an interesting question. Thanks. Yeah, as you say, in Sentina um, Bay itself, there is only the Berg River which supplies um, winter, um, new, mostly input of fresh water in winter, which of course is, is um, when waters tend to be oxygenated. Um, um, I think perhaps the um, we need to perhaps have a final question. Um, did you find a correlation between the nutrient data and wind direction? Mm, that's a really good question. So um, I did not actually look at the nutrient data themselves because um, there's not that there's more oxygen data than there are nutrient data. So I, I did not look at the um, at the correlation between wind, winds and nutrients. But that's a good point. I should look into that in the future. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Annette. I think we must call it a day there. We are half hours up. Um, thank but you. thank you very much for a very good talk. Um, and sorry to the others who have, who have followed up with questions. Um, moving on to our next speaker, um, that is Bronwyn Curry. And she's going to be giving a presentation um, entitled Oxygen Calls the Shots in the Northern Benguel Upwelling System of Namibia. Um, Bronwyn is um, now retired, but worked at the National Marine Research and Information Center in Swakopmund for, I think, almost 25 years. And here her research interests were um, diverse from coastal zones to um, aquaculture, um, food safety, and also the offshore environment. But um, more recently, um, Bronwyn has been involved with issues relating to sustainability of ocean resources, and of course, the services they provide. And um, with that, I'll hand over to Bronwyn. Thank you. Right, hello everybody. Um, I trust that you can see the screen, if not shout. And can you hear me? I take that as a yes. Okay, so um, 
First of all, hello from, from uh, Swakop Munt at the National Marine Information and Research Center. My colleagues, uh, Paul Kaengi, Sarah Paulus, Richard Horeb, and Anya van der Plus. And to start with a quote, one of my favorite quotes, despite the Namibian shark being considered one of the most inhospitable, oxygen depleted and sulfitic open shark environments on earth, it has sustained one of the world's most spectacular concentrations of marine life. We ask ourselves how? Well, of course, it's an ancient and a mature system with the ecosystem functioning adapted to this natural extreme environment. And um, what we're really interested in is how the continued ecosystem services that we expect from these living resources will continue. Uh, so this is really a synthesis of how the system manages and what we expect and hope to continue. So the ocean plays a crucial role in the ecosystem functioning off Namibia's coast. Perennial upwelling at Luderitz produces massive downstream um, production. And um, uh, you can see on, on the right, the, the huge production, phytoplankton production, this is mirrored in the sediments. Um, you can see the difference between Namibia, Angola, South Africa, where a lot of the production sinks to the bottom with decay. And that adds to the low oxygen that is already present in the upwelling water um, to give some dangerously low shelf oxygen concentrations. Um, here we see a picture of the, um, the the, the, the annual oxygen and the 200 meter and the 500 meter isobars are marked there. So you can see the whole of the central shelf is extremely low in oxygen, ranging from less than 0.5 milliliters to 0.2 milliliters, well below the uh, 48 micromolar mark all the time. And um, to go back to the ecosystem services, shallow water hake are an important commercially fished resource. That's the Molucius capensis. Although it's fished demersally in 200 meters water depth and slightly deeper, the, it is an active carnivore throughout the pelagic water. Um, the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources does annual research monitoring cruises, which are independent of industry, to measure all the standard biological and oceanographic parameters for each fishery. So for this Hague fishery, here you can see the coverage along the coast, a very tight coverage from north to south in Namibia. Um, also, you will notice the catches on the right that are marked, and you see that the catches of the Hague are very close, closely aligned with the low oxygen water going right almost into the less than 0.2 milliliters per liter water. These oxygen concentrations are all of course CTD. And for the research trawls, a finer mesh is used and larger bobbins on the nets. So these go deeper and they do allow epibenthus collection from the trawls, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we've selected out for this, the area between 23 and um, 26, about 25, 26 because it shows this nice range and as well as the hair catches close onto the very low oxygen water. So, but of course we're concerned when we're talking about fisheries, we're concerned mainly with the water column. And there you can clearly see that at least half the water column is less than one, uh, one milliliter per liter of oxygen. Um, again, showing also that here the the main recruitment of Hake, it doesn't show you here, but I'm going to show you later, is around this 24 degree area, contributing to these catches, no doubt. To take you through the um, life cycle of the Hake, the adults come slightly inshore to water depths of 200 to 300 meters, lay the eggs, which are neutrally buoyant, and they're brought inshore by the subsurface um, undercurrent to the inshore pelagic nursery areas, which are actually nursery areas shared by many of the commercial species. 
the young hake develop there and they have to take quite a, a difficult trip over the very low oxygen water inshore. This is from about 50 meters to 150 meters over the sediment, which is loaded with hydrogen sulfide, but also covered with the sulfide oxidizing bacteria. Nevertheless, the oxygen levels are extremely low there. Much of it is below 0 0,2 milliliters per liter. And they then join the offshore um, adult hake uh, populations. Now these juveniles develop and they are feeding mainly on, on gobies. Gobies now feed mainly on gobies, previously a lot on the pilchard, but pilchard are not many there anymore. The gobies are showing this high resolution acoustic picture down to about 120 meters. You can see that they have this um, strategy of migrating from the anoxic sediment into the um, water, high water levels when the oxygen levels rise to about more than 7% saturation, approximately 0 0,2 milliliters per liter they spend. The night up there, they are eaten sometimes by uh, other predators there, and then they descend and have their refuge in the, in the um, mud. This has been well documented. I won't go into the details, um, but it does show the importance of the gobies using this area. Also looking from the north to the south, we can see this, this gap in the, um, in, in, the, in the transect of this high resolution acoustics where the gobies are really the main player there and they are providing a lot of food until the oxygen rises to comma three to comma four milliliters per liter where they join by hake and horse maple and that sort of thing. Also um, here, of course, the phytoplankton doesn't show up, but one can see the massive amount of life in the shelf at these depths up to 120 meters, 160, and then going offshore. Uh, some video coverage of this done um, on, on some German cruises, one can see the hake going over the um, water in this is 158 meters depth. Uh, the sulfide muds are covered by the bacteria there. And we see an example here, of the bottom oxygen levels partitioning the resources within very narrow limits, because although the hake can tolerate low oxygen, not as low as the gobies um, where they live. So these show nicely the hake, these juvenile hake on their trip to join the adults. Down to 200 meters. Um, how did we find out this out about the, diff the partitioning of the hake and the goby uh, tolerances? This was done with some very neat experiments on board uh, the SARS in 2008, where the hearts were extracted of these live animals and exposed to anoxia and to normoxia and the heartbeat frequency measured. So with the goby, normoxia, we see the normal heartbeat recorded anoxia, the heart slowing down, but full recovery when normoxia was re re uh, uh, given to them. With Hake, the same sort of thing. They managed to put up with anoxia, but after normoxia for recovery, which of course is the important part of an experiment, there was no recovery. So they can tolerate down to 0, 0,3 the Hake, but whereas the Gobi can go into complete anoxia, and as, as we know, they do. Just as a summary for the Gobi, it's presently a key prey of commercial, um, sorry, oh, it's stuck. Slides seem to not be moving on. I don't know what's happened here. There we are. Okay, there were the experiments showing the anoxia. Um, the goby is so important in the system at the moment. They remain alert in anoxia and in sulfidic um, shocks, including when we have these sulfide eruptions. So they have their refuge in the sulfidic mud. That's their natural protection. They eat jellyfish, that's got nothing to do with the oxygen, but it does help when um, there's so many jellyfish around and they appear to remain abundant to date. 
So to manage oxygen limits, what's really important in our system is the biological benthic pelagic coupling with specialized plankton and fish manipulating these low oxygen areas. Lots of food in the pelagic area, but not enough oxygen in the demersal and benthic areas. Of course, the um, zooplankton are extremely important in the system. They, the trophic link in the food webs they are most abundant over the shelf where we have this low oxygen. And they develop different strategies to cope with this oxygen minimum zone physiologically and behaviorally. Um, the euphorsids, for example, which are important diet of the hake, have this vertical migration, euphorsia hanseni, goes to also more or less hide in um, areas where the oxygen gets below 0 0,3 milliliters per liter. And we see a lot of, of strategies also in the copy pots in the, in the uh, more inshore waters. Um, we see this also in an offshore transect where the, the zooplankton actually avoid this very low oxygen sort of between 60 and 200 meters. So then going on to the benthos, the benthos, I'm not going to talk about the um, sediment benthos, the infauna, macrofauna. Um, we should be aware that the whole shelf is soft sediments. We don't have these hard, rocky shores, the rocky shelf. And in that inner sulfidic um, area, the fauna is tiny and associated with the sulfide oxidizing mats. As we go, to the mid to the outer shelf. Um, there's increasing oxygen, increasing diversity, size, and abundance. Again, I won't concentrate on the infauna of the sediments, but the epifauna that we get from the trawls uh, shows also abundance density transition as the oxygen increases. And we are selecting out three types of this epifauna, the sponges, uh, some cushion stars and tunicates, it's mainly sort of sessile, animals that have to put up with the low oxygen. Uh, moving to the outer shelf, as the oxygen gets uh, plentiful, in, in Namibian terms, one milliliter per liter is, is plentiful, oxygen is low, no longer a stressor, and we, of course, get the small, varied, and much, much larger animals um, on the outer shelf and down the slope. But really, uh, the original classic work of Sanders of Wolfish Bay said it all as an example of upwelling regions. How uh, inshore uh, the fauna of the benthic fauna capitalizes on the inshore food and shows amazing distributions according to very, very small changes in oxygen availability. He showed that the inshore sinking organic matter depletes the bottom, bottom oxygen to less than 2% saturation that we see abiotic conditions directly under the upwelling that we see offshore gradual increase in diversity as the oxygen increase that we see in the epifauna too, and this dramatic increase with small oxygen increases um, it, we see from the very inner shore as the oxygen increases to about comma two to comma three milliliters per liter. So from 100 meters to 200 milliliters meters density of animals increasing 240 times Sanders showed and the drop off in density at 300 meters when there's not as much food but there is enough oxygen. I put this onto a table to show how um, the density abundance of the sponges, the echinoderm, sorry, the echinoderm and the ascidian all shows this increase in line with what um, Sanders showed on the uh, in fauna of the sediment in fauna, this massive increase as soon as there's enough oxygen with the abundant food. We've also, and I've learned recently that sponges do have this common ability to uptake oxygen at very low ox oxygen concentrations. We've seen that very clearly in the trawl epifauna. And there are these recent publications talking about this. So to put it all together, We've got this massive primary production uh, along this open coast, open upwelling coast of Namibia. The inside shore, the shallowest areas, lots of hydrogen sulfide in the sediments, but the gobies, 
manipulating that. And we have the young hag also manipulating oxygen being fed by the gobies until they reach a more livable, livable oxygen concentration at the same time with massive explosion of the benthos at these slight increases of oxygen and all the time the abundant zooplankton over the shelf as necessary during the migrations up and down and providing food. I've just shown the three uh, benthic, epibenthic species as we get to the out of shelf, of course, I haven't outlined what all the others are. But what is critical here is this real productivity hotspot between 150 and 300 meters on the shelf where everything comes together with um, species that are really well adapted to very, very low oxygens, but showing incre incredible abundances there. So what? All, all, this, all these different aspects have, it, have been shown in various ways in many, many publications in the last um, 20 years or so. The coastal upwelling regions provide really, really, really critical uh, direct services as food, and this is expected to continue. Um, Namibia relies heavily on its commercial fisheries. The northern Benguela Namibian coastal system has been molded over many centuries, and it functions under the severe hypoxic stress. The central and the outer shelf are definitely biological hotspots for functioning under the severe, severe stress. Uh, but we do know from, from the experimental work that has been done that these animals are living right on the edge of critical oxygen tolerances. And we expect them, therefore, to be sensitive to any further decreases should they happen. Future pressures, we also all know that there's huge pressure on the ocean now to deliver more and more. There's a lot of pressure on coastal systems. And uh, where will it come to the point of overload? And the biological response, what will the biological response be to this? We know that we are expecting services. And, and when we're talking about ecosystem services, we, of course, mean uh, services to humans. So um, the integrated knowledge that we accumulating over time must feed into management decisions regarding sustainability. And, oops. Sorry, the routine scientific monitoring will continue as will, um, as will the knowledge uh, that is added. And this will, uh, this, will con this will contribute to the sustainability of the services we trust. So the um, living marine resources are well regulated and they are well monitored here. We are also making a lot of effort towards the ecosystem approach to fisheries, as are um, many countries. Um, it's a difficult one, that one. But also the information will contribute to the eco-labeling of fishery products, as is being done here for, for the um, shallow water hake. And with that, that's all I've got to say, just some um, Acknowledgements, of course, all the um, all the information here resides with the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources, but we really need to acknowledge the lovely uh, benthic guide that has come out from Laura Atkinson and uh, workshops given by Dosi Indeep, looking at the epifauna, as well, of course, the Nansen pro other other identification guides the Nansen program and all the cruises and ports, the collaboration that we had with the Gobi work and the genus system and geochemistry and ecology, all this contributes to the knowledge that we need. And with that, thank you. So thanks very much, Bradman, for an entertaining talk. And again, <laughs> um, can you please put your questions in the Q&A box? You, you did touch on it, and perhaps this is not an entirely fair question, but um, the, the impacts of proposed mining, um, would they, be, in terms, especially on the oxygen environment, would they be notable? You know, the, um, the, 
you're talking about the proposed the phosphate mining. Um, it, it, it's exactly where all this activity is happening, middle outer shelf, middle outer shelf. So one would expect that these sediments, as I said, they're soft sediments and they're very anoxic sediments. And uh, that sort of mining will go down to many meters, uh, disturbance of the sediments. One would expect it to affect the oxygen, but I, I would imagine more dangerous is what, what will be unearthed with all these sediments and put into the water column. Runner, I don't know if you can see the Q&A box, but there's a question from just Peter Brunt. Um, um, it's just out here. Um, and I can read the question to you if you like. Yeah. yeah. Is there the possibility that Gobi and other species may stay at the bottom to avoid stronger currents that could move them away. Um, you know, the Gobi is not only on the inshore area, it's also right to the outer shelf uh, where there are, there are pretty strong currents there, strong jets. Um, so I don't think so. I don't think the currents are affecting the distribution of the Gobi. I think, you know, the Gobi, the Gobi, we've learned a lot about in the last 20 years. It used to be called a pelagic Gobi, when in fact it should really be called a, a demersal Gobi um, from what we've learned. They also breed on the bottom. They have, they have to attach their eggs, which was also not known uh, previously. It's possible it is a very small fish, um, but it's pretty motile, so I doubt that it's on the bottom because of the, of the currents. I think that it's, it's really exploiting its ability to put up with zero oxygen down at the bottom. And um, it's, as I said, it's also known to breed there with, with parental care of the eggs. Another question, um, great talk, Bronwyn. Are there predictions available for how the system might change with global warming and other changes, changes in currents, temperatures, spatial changes for the anoxic area, et cetera? No, the, the, short, the, the, the short answer is no, as far as I know. Um, looking at the expected changes and, and, and the, of course, the threats that, that abound um, for this area, I think we do see that as far as oxygen goes, the, the fauna is very well adapted to it because it's had time to adapt. And as far as I know, we're not seeing any very marked changes like it have been seen, say in the California current, really, really intense, intensified uh, low oxygen changes. For the rest, as far as, as warming and that sort of thing goes, um, I'm not sure. We, we have seen some, you know, back in, in um, 1994, there was, was an intense low oxygen uh, event. And then these juvenile hake was sort of chased by very, very, very low oxygen deeper and they got cannibalized by the adults more. So um, predictions for this, as far as I know, um, someone might be, from the audience might know better, but as far as I know, there haven't been any very definite um, predictions about this. One of the chief concerns is what you asked about earlier about the possibility of mining because the, um, I mean, that's a global concern, but the phosphate resources stretch along most of the coast. Okay, um, he has a challenging question. Um, you said the system is mature with respect to hypoxia. How long do you think it takes for a system that is turning hypoxic to get mature and develop an adapted ecosystem? I, well, you know, these, these, these things seem to sort themselves out, but I would say it would take at least 500 years, at least, 
in my opinion. One can't tell, one should start right from the bacteria. And uh, that, that is something that's very, very, um, very much ignored present day. It's, it's coming into its own, but if one starts with the bacteria, bacteria are so flexible. I mean, within a, within a month or so, bacteria can adapt. So if we're talking about the end, end users, the end products, the fish, et cetera, that will take a long time, I would imagine. Okay, Veronique and if, wants and to know what enough. acts... Sorry? I don't know if that's um, good enough. <laughs> what oxygen change could the gobies tolerate to survive? From what we've seen, um, I'm sure most of the audience knows about the intense um, hydrogen sulfide eruptions that we have. We have never had death of gobies from those even, and that is when the entire water column gets anoxic. They do tend to come more to the surface then, but they can live in, in complete anoxia, zero. They can live in sulfidic. They, in fact, bury themselves in the sulfidic muds. They do that for a period of up to eight hours, um, and then they come up as I showed the migrations to replenish that oxygen debt. So I don't think there's much limit on the gobies un unless the entire water column was to become entirely anoxic. They only need to get to 7% oxygen saturation to replenish their oxygen debt, which is amazing. So I think the gobies will be fine. Um, the hake, of course, are also limited to everything above comma three milliliters per liter. So it's more likely to affect the others. I think the gobies will be fine. They're, they're a winner in the system. Okay, then there's a um, question from Dimitri. You mentioned about trophic relationships between hate and gobies. Could you add more on that? Are these circumstantial observations or are these estimations of rates of predation? And is there, in fact, a top-down control? The relationship has been shown that for the juvenile gobies now, this is in this period, um, also people might be aware that the hag used to feed mainly on the very abundant pilchard in, this, in the system. And the pilchard have been missing from the system to a large extent for, for many years, since the late 90s, earlier than that. And it has been shown that juvenile hake, their diet comprises 80 to 100% of the gobies now. So that's the direct relationship. Um, it's not as, as, as nutritious, but it's been a substitute um, and it's, it's keeping there. Whether it's a, a top-down, um, Dimitri, is it a top-down uh, control over the population of the gobies or... Is that what's meant? It looks like it, um, I think. Yeah. It, yeah, from what we can see, the Gobi population is not diminishing despite being preyed upon by not only the hake, uh, I mean, all the different fish and the birds and the seals and everything are resorting to eating hake, uh, eating gobies, um, where they, they used to have a lot of pilchard available to them. It's, it, as I said, it's not as good a diet and it's been blamed for diminishing the populations of the predators, but we don't really see, and I've been trying to find out whether there's a marked decrease in the Gobi population and it seems not. Okay, um, I think our hour is up. So thank you again, Ronan. Thank you, Annette. And thank you to the attendees for all your questions, your active participation, and also to the IOC for um, organizing these webinars. Keep your look out for the next webinar, It'll probably be in December. It hasn't been announced yet. And then once again, finally, um, please look out for the uh, special section at the symposium on the effects of climate change in the world's oxygen. So thank you and um, goodbye. <laughs>